Dr. Doreen Downing, welcome to the show. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. Thank you, Laban. I know you and I have had conversations and I'm always laughing and learning at the same time. Isn't that a great kind of connection, great kind of conversation to have with somebody? You laugh and you learn. I would, I would argue it's probably the only way to go about <laughs> life. Yeah. You don't really cry and learn too much these days, do you? Not I, not anymore. <laughs> and, you know, I am, you'll probably say what I am, but I am a psychologist and that was how I was trained to get people to cry. Isn't that amazing? It was at UC Berkeley PhD program and, you know, get people way down into their stuff and make them sniff it <laughs> and uh, really have them find, find the, the pain, which I think is obviously I can do and it's important to find those moments. But what I think psychology didn't really teach me and I learned all by myself was to go deeper inside of where the brilliance, where the beauty, where the power, where the being, where the essence is. <laughs> UC Berkeley does not talk about the essence of who we are. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about that today. And you remind me of my very first session with a gambling counselor by the name of Lee. And she asked me a question about my mother. And I exploded into guttural weeping <laughs> for about <laughs> three quarters of the session. But it was a pivotal moment because she also spoke yeah. about the link between coping mechanisms and escapism behavior as a result of growing up in a less than nurturing environment, which is something that I'm sure you've, you know, lots about given your background. Mm -hmm. I, I like that phrase that you just use, which makes it seem like um, you said less than nurturing environment. And a lot of times when I work with people and help them go back to those early roots of anxiety, those early roots in their families, they go, oh, no, no, I don't want to blame my parents. But it's not blame. It's just discovery of perhaps facts <laughs> that uh, happened. And it wasn't the best learning, nurturing environment to grow your spirit, your sense of self. Now, Dr. Doreen, you're a, an amazing author. You're a coach. You are a PhD in just the most fascinating subject for me. And you help people conquer the fear of speaking. And I wondered if you might be able to share what it is that you look at when you're working with people that are terrified of getting up on the stage. Well, not only up on stage, a lot of the people I work with never have to give a presentation, but they're part of a team at a meeting, you know, they want to raise their hand and they want to give their opinion, but they feel like, you know, it's not really that valuable. Somebody else has already said it better. So they hold themselves back. So it's not just stage. I guess I want to make that clear to people is that speaking anxiety pretty much goes along uh, wherever you show up, there you are. And you've got your speaking anxiety, if it's in a meeting or if an interview for a job, perhaps even just, I know I have to tell you, and I will later on any of my personal stories, but just sitting at a dinner table with family, with extended family, it's like, Ooh, everybody's talking and there. You can't find a space to say, hello, I'd like to offer something here. So yeah, speaking anxiety comes in all forms, not just in standing up and being afraid to be in the stage. I think there's something about the, the tension spotlight, you might say, on you. And that could happen, like I said, just anywhere with a, in class, you know, growing up with, uh, like, as I mentioned, just a group of friends. What's your definition of the word oxymoron with regards to you and your own experience? Well, oxymoron to me feels like, you know, you're, you're doing something, you're saying something and what it's questionable. So here I had a PhD in psychology. I am doing research in UC Berkeley and I'm asked to give a presentation and somebody says, what? You're afraid of speaking in public, so you're refusing to give your research results? And I said, yes, I'm not going to do it. Stay away. I will not. And the 
you know, that was a moment. It was, uh, it's an oxymoron to have uh, a certain kind of pretense and uh, way in the world and image and yet hiding, hiding, hiding <laughs> that I was afraid to show up and offer more of what I know and who I am to the public. That's a really wonderful explanation. I'm so glad that you picked up on my <laughs> fairly subtle question there. What what feelings did that elicit? Oh, oh. <laughs> helps me go back to that moment where I felt obviously embarrassed. Um, I feel sad for myself. I felt ashamed. And but there's also something about finding a moment where um, it's a turning point and to be able to make a choice. And I know you're all about choices, my dear, huh? <laughs> so making a choice to, instead of avoiding, instead of pretending, instead of refusing life <laughs> to actually say, Oh, I know what I have to do. I have to step toward my fear. <gasps> oh no. So that's what I did. I looked up San Francisco Learning Annex and picked a course, How to Overcome Your Fear of Public Speaking. I showed up quivering and never did take a turn that night, but I knew I had to go back the next month and the next month and the next month. I just knew I had to keep taking myself back to where it was scary. And then finally, uh, I was able to take a turn. It was even then even scarier to get up in front of people, it, terrified, shivering, quivering. And, uh, you know, isn't that amazing that I had all those physical reactions yet had a PhD in psychology? <laughs> but it was true, you know, like living in the truth of your fear feels so liberating to live in the truth and to move through it slowly, gently, until the breakthrough happened. And there was one, one time this teacher said that was the breakthrough for me. And it's a very beautiful moment, a very beautiful quote by Michelangelo. Michelangelo saw the angel in the marble and he chiseled until he set it free, you know? And that was me. I had this PhD and I was so professional, but inside I had this angel who was longing to come out, but she couldn't in all these professional settings. And that's how come I think that the people who find me who are professional corporate people, I've got worked with lawyers, I've worked with VP of sales of all things that are hiding, they are hiding and they're working hard to cover it up and script every word and rehearse, 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 but they aren't naturally themselves. So that, that idea of the angel in the marble is uh, something that I hope inspires who's ever listening today to think, yeah, inside of me, there's more, there's more of me that's possible to come out. It reminds me of a book that I uh, read by Chris Widener called Angel on the Inside. I believe it was Chris Widener. Mm. Have you come across that at all? No, but I'm going to write it down and make sure I look it up. Chris Widener is a Hall of Fame speaker uh, in the US. Um, and he, he wrote a parable based on Michelangelo and the, uh, and the angel on the inside, mm -hmm. obviously. And it just ties in beautifully with what you're talking about there. And the thing that I love about the work that you're doing, uh, Doreen, is that what, what has been the outcome in your life as a result of facing your fear and, and heading towards it anyway? I think for anybody who takes that, uh, it's a hero's journey, isn't it? To uh, not really know what the destination is. It wasn't like I had a goal to be more confident. I had a goal to find my real self. I had a goal to be authentic. It was, my goal was to uh, 
not have fear, not have anxiety anymore, to have freedom, I guess you might say. So uh, I would I would say that that was the outcome is way more freedom. And with way more freedom, I have way more opportunities, willing to walk through way more, you know, way more doors here you and I are speaking, you know, so it feels like the whole answer to what you just asked was uh, moving, the result is moving towards discovering more of what is possible. And when you discover more of what is possible, life opens up to you. It's no longer just one narrow little, you know, 10 degrees, it becomes 360 degrees, not only 360 degrees, whatever the sphere, whatever, however many degrees there are in a sphere, it's just like, so much is possible if you find inner strength, but it's got to be an inner, for me, it was an inside job. And that's what I teach is how to go inside to find your voice. I think that applies to every single person, Doran, I, I really do. It's as soon as I was able to address the self-love component of me is really when my life transformed in areas that I can't even really quantify at this point, but it was all good stuff. And your, your beautiful book, Essential Speaking, The Seven Step Guide to Finding Your Real Voice. How important is self-talk yes how important is it's it's well it depends if it's negative it's not too i mean it's important in that it's stopping you blocking you if it's positive so the whole uh, it, it's learning how to distinguish those messages that you got when you were really young about yourself that got planted you know, there are two neuroscientists that wrote a book, um, Rewire the Anxious Brain, Carl and Pittman. And they talk about the wiring that has to do with anxiety, that it's the frontal part of your brain, like has the self-talk. And then the back part of your brain is a whole different neurological wired system. So that's that explains why sometimes people say, I, I shouldn't get afraid, you know, these are all friendly people, or I know my content, or there's nothing I need to be afraid of. After all, you know, I've, I've been working on this project for so many weeks, years, months, whatever, but I, but they still get anxious, terribly anxious. So how do you explain that? And I think that the neuroscientists have, have shown us that we need to work on not just change, you know, the CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, changing the mind and the self-talk, that that's good. It will take you someplace. <laughs> Obviously, if you change, I am going to fail to, hey, I'm going to succeed. You know, that's going to help. But what happens when that isn't, that doesn't happen and you can't trust your mind to lead you and guide you? It sometimes is locked in the subconscious and that needs to be approached in a different sort of way like through um, meditation visualization a deeper kind of i have systematic desensitization process i do guided imagery there's all sorts of other ways that that part of the brain learns how to shift out of fear and anxiety so that I think I was, uh, you asked about self-talk, but um, yes, yeah, self-talk comes from one part of the brain and the deeper kind of um, belief, let, let, let's say that it's harder to change belief than it is self-talk. So if the belief is based on those early years, it's in there, got some work to do to <laughs> get down in there and and to transform it, but also getting down in there. We I talked about discovery. Ah, it's not just looking and crashing and getting through all that marble and chunking it up. It's about finding your angel and your spirit. So it's worth it. It's worth it to move deep down and uh, feel the pain and keep on going. 
listening to you speak is so relaxing. It's so it's such a delight. And I, I know people listening to this just on the audio will be probably thinking the same thing. It's so lovely. And I'm just, uh, it's like a warm breeze just, um, you know, flowing across my face. And I, the, the question was semi-loaded because recently I spoke to a guy who's become a good friend of mine, Dr. Alan uh, Thompson, who's an artificial intelligence guy, but he uh, did like a natural sciences degree uh, in somewhere in the US. And have you heard of the watermelon seed study? It sounds vaguely familiar, but I couldn't repeat it. If, But that's, it does sound, tell me. That's okay. So what they did is they had a control of three lots of watermelon seeds and they had them basically in the same environment. They were identical. And one, one group uh, they ignored and they didn't do anything. One group, they spoke hate and told the plant that they effing hating, hated it and that it would never amount to anything. And blah, blah. and the third group, they, they these daily affirmations of like, I love you, you will grow, like you will grow to 10 centimeters and, and like to, to watermelon seeds, right? And this has been repeated a number of times. So it's not a fluke or an accident. It, it is highly repeatable. And that's what makes it so beautiful that guess what happens, right? Yes. The, water, the watermelon seed that was loved and encouraged grew to 10 centimetres and the other two, nothing happened. Mm -hmm. And it was such a powerful metaphor for the power of language because in my own experience, Doreen, eliminating negative self-talk has been easily one of the greatest things I've ever done for myself because not only has it helped me with the positive affirmational side of things, it's allowed me to become hyper aware of the people that I was around and if necessary to cut them out of my life. And I was yeah. just curious to know what, what your thoughts on that was. Yes. Well, you pinpointed energy, right? Energy. And so that um, the, where I go more deeply with people around the essence of who they are, it's a brilliant it's the most powerful, it's love probably is what we're saying is if you can reach underneath all of those messages, and I think it is important to change those messages, but how do you do it? You do it from having access and know what this other energy is, which is the essence of who you are, or the spirit, or the soul, or the core, the core positive uh, qualities that are inside of you. So I was thinking that you just don't replace it, you have to do it energetically so that there's more full transformation is what I'm thinking as I listen to you. So this leads me to my next question. Let's pretend that Annie. Jane and Uncle Dave are listening to this and they've got a uh, an engagement party speech to deliver at their son or daughter. <laughs> and the thought of getting up on stage has caused them to evacuate their bowels. What advice can you give them to help them do better at what they need to do? Oh, I have so much to say about that. <laughs> I have somebody who started seeing me in January who has a wedding in, who had a wedding in September, he knew that he could not walk down. Well, he didn't have to walk down the aisle, but he knew he would not be able to say his vows out loud in front of an audience. So that's, uh, that's important. It wasn't just, it's a long story because what it turns out, he, there were so many places in his life that he wasn't living his truth. And actually we went more than just speaking we helped him get out of the job that was horrible for him and find uh, his way into a whole new career. So uh, it, because I'm a psychologist, I help people open up to not just their speaking fears, but hey, let's look at all of life because you show up, your voice is in every single corner, right? You show up at work and if you're pretending and you don't like your work and you're working on projects all day long and you are unhappy then how can you how can where's that spirit that you're talking about the positive spirit if you're if you're depressed about the work that you do so anyway back to the wedding <laughs> uh, let's see in fact I was just officiating a wedding uh, two weeks ago 
And this is a different story, a different man, but he started to speak his vows and he started crying. And I had to hold space. You know, I know that he was feeling embarrassed. I know that he was feeling like he wanted to run, <laughs> but he couldn't, you know, because the whole, the wedding ceremony was in process. So what I did was just open my arms like this, you know, like kind of in symbolically holding them. I didn't touch them, but I just he's, held he's my arms out. Putting yeah. them out wide for those. Yeah. Put, yes. Yeah. You're saying, yeah. Putting my arms out wide so that the audience could see me and feel me like I'm holding them too. Everybody's wow. The whole audience is crying by now as he's crying. And then she, the bride reaches over and, and holds his hand and just looks him in the eye, just opens up to him. She doesn't say anything. She just holds him. And then he, and then he was able to gather it, but that's what he was speaking about to her, how, how she knows him, sees him, feels him and can reach to him. And that's what I said out loud to the audience. This is what he's talking about. What just happened. What you just witnessed is what he is talking about in the vows. So it was, uh, so your wedding kind of analogy is what <laughs> brought that to mind that the people who are afraid about standing up and giving a speech, like a best man speech or something, it's, um, I think I, it's not a speech, is it? It's about expressing your love and your care and what just what you appreciate about the friendship and how to do that in a way from your heart, how to speak from your heart, as opposed to how to speak from a script. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. And I had no idea for our audience listening about that analogy. I just, it was something that intuitively came to me. And uh, as someone who has become really fearless in everything I do, give or take, uh, I, um, it's become really easy for me now <laughs> and I can, I can talk to anyone. Um, I wrote something on my hand that I think is really important for a number of people that are looking to ask for help and looking to ask for help, not so that they appear weak, but so that they can remain strong. And it's something that I've experienced. I was very blessed. The first psychologist I got access to, Lee, was this wonderful woman that I got access to for a year and a half for free. But I have had an experience later on when I didn't gel with the shrink. And and I want to know, Doreen, what, how do you know you've found a great psychologist for you? Well, I've been in the business for 40, over 40 years. <laughs> And I've had some people who walk in where it's felt like it isn't quite a match. So how to, well, it's hard to tell somebody who doesn't know how to tap into it, intuition. But what I tell people to do is first call and listen to the voice on the phone, you know, like, hello, this is Dr. Doreen Downing. And I, you know, whatever. And do you like the sound? Does it feel like you're drawn? just to the sound of the voice and what they say and how they say it is, hello, I'm Dr. Doreen Downing. And I, you know, there's a difference, there's a tone, there's a, a, um, a way of speaking. And so I ask people to first listen to the voicemail. And then if that's your first clue, you know, learn to go yes or no pretty quickly. <laughs> and then uh, call with your questions and whatever questions that you might have and then have a conversation. The next step would be to have a conversation and see if it uh, feels good. Cause it has to be a feeling. That's what therapy is about. It's all about feeling. It's not, it's not about, uh, you know, well, a lot of therapy is about putting on band-aids and problem solving for sure. But I think more deeply what people are needing and finding is more of who they really are, their authentic self, so they can, their potential, let's put it that way, their potential, even though they might not know that's what they're looking for. <laughs> well, a vibrational frequency uh, are the two words that just uh, ram into my mind when it comes to yeah. 
picking up on being a great connection and I rely on my intuition so much more heavily than I ever have. And what people need to realize, and I'll keen to get your thoughts on this, Doreen, is that when they say I'm not a great speaker or no one would want to listen to me, is what they need to appreciate is that because of your unique vibrational frequency, it resonates with a certain percentage of the population. Once you once you're able to be at peace with what your purpose is and what your message is and be clear on that messaging, it, it vibrates in a way that, that brings the right people and repels the wrong ones. And I was just curious to know what your thoughts on that are. I liked what you said, peace, and I liked purpose. And the other P that came to mind as I was listening to you was passion. And passion is that kind of energy, isn't it? Where that vibrational, uh, the resonance of you... <laughs> that that's what that's I think that's what our connection connection is is that we we resonate in such a way that uh, there's a listening and a wanting to listen to more and more and more and I feel like helping people find their voice and that's what my podcast is which you get to be on soon <laughs> uh, that helping people find their voice is like finding I mean, we don't say the resonance but the passion and then they they're lined up with their purpose and then there's there's peace there's no fear there's just i'm living my life my passion my purpose and i'm at peace beautifully put and the the gentleman that you're working with that you mentioned before that you found uh, he's he moved out of the work that he was in is so profound because the universe sends us very obvious signals which I ignored for a very long time. I worked in recruitment for 14 years, which given how hard it was for me, I did okay. And, but what it was, it was the universe saying, uh, 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 this isn't for you, Laban, get out of it. And so it made it really difficult for me. <laughs> and it's only now that I've figured out what my reason for being on this damn planet is, is that it's like, ah, oh, is that what it was like for you? Uh, let's see. I think... I, I think I was in touch with my purpose really early on being the daughter of a depressed mother and a older sister to a younger one. And I, I just think that that's what I was in this life to do was to uh, do this kind of helping people move from difficulty into a brighter life. And I remember my grandmother taking care of us because mother was in and out of hospitals having depression. And uh, when she was home and when, when mom was home at, at my grandma's, there was this garden outside. Grandma loved roses, <laughs> geraniums, gladiolas. And I'd go out and there was just this bountiful color and fragrance, red roses. <laughs> and when I went back into the house, it was cold, dark, depression. We had to be quiet or else mom would go back to the hospital. You know, she kept saying, shh, shh. So it was just like dungeon inside, but outside it was, and it's so symbolic, isn't it? Here's, here's a threshold called the front door <laughs> and going in is uh, dark and going out is bright. Hello. <laughs> which, which, where do I want to live? I want to live outside, but I know that people I love are inside, you know, I have to, so I have this, I, I, I guess I have this kind of sense of what you're saying is purpose, um, responsibility, maybe, um, just got to be careful not to be too responsible for too many people, but, you know, I, I've worked on that one, so I don't think I burden myself with responsibility, but I do have purpose to help people find the light and the, not just the light outside in their garden, but the light inside of them. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing, Doreen. I know, th and what a wonderful thing to experience, to find your purpose so early, like took me 38 damned years. And I know some people die with it inside them, but your fear of speaking wasn't innate. You developed it. And I wonder if you'd share that story with us. Well, that what I just said about my grandma, I think that was one of the moments when I did the deep dive underneath, 
yeah, I went to UC Berkeley. Yeah, there was competition. Yeah, you had to raise your hand and there were a lot of smart people. Huh? <laughs> so yeah, that's when I became aware of it at that level of me being moving myself out into school and work and the outer society that was less protected. But when I uh, actually started doing that uncovering and that deeper work inside of myself, that's when I came up with those earlier moments of life where uh, I, my grandma had said, be quiet or else, or else there's going to be real damage here if you speak up. So, yeah, that's one of the underlying subconscious, you know, that I had to deal with. But again, the teacher who said the angel in the marble helped me, inspired me to say, oh, there's, there's, I can go deeper than that wound, you know, and if we go deep to the being, then we've got more energy, just the vibration that you're talking about, vibration of healing, of love love from within towards ourselves and when we do that it feels like we embrace all those wounds from deep down inside of us we come up and just you know like i put my arms out about holding that man at the wedding who was crying holding myself my little precious jewel inside that uh, i couldn't show but now i get to shine <laughs> and you've done so beautifully as well doreen so well done to you and and I want to I want to explore um, an area that is of very keen interest to me. I've had a number of uh, medical experts on the podcast. One of whom was Dr. Chris Palmer, who's a an adjunct professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. And those that have heard me talk about this guy before will have heard the story. He he works with type two uh, bipolar disorder, the worst chronic, you know, suicidal depression and schizophrenia disorders. And for more than a decade now, he's been putting into full remission one third of all his patients using a ketogenic protocol that they developed for epilepsy in children 120 years ago. Another one third significant reductions in medication and symptoms and one third at this point, no noticeable change or difference. And your in your studies, what work have you learned about this area of anxiety, depression and mental health issues? Well, as I listen to you right now, I was saying, boy, I wish I knew that person uh, or wish my mother knew the, that person way back in the 50s because she went to a, a state mental hospital and had ECT. And I think that's partly what uh, destroyed shock her. therapy. Yeah. E yeah. Electroconvulsive therapy yeah ect and uh boy i wish i wish <laughs> palmer or whoever what is that his name palmer chris chris palmer yeah dr yeah chris palmer, yeah oh so no i have no experience except for people that start to see me who are using medication to calm them themselves you know the beta blockers and say i just don't want to get hooked but I can't, you know, I know I could do it. I know I could speak without anxiety, but I got to take this medicine, but I don't want to. And so that's, that's, that's a challenge because they're, they're pretty addicted by then because it's psychological dependency as well as a physical dependency. So how to help them learn to do the same thing that medicine does. It's like we have this internal pharmacy so let's learn, you know, a lot about medical, you know, alternative medicine and how to, how to use that for people. So I think that uh, learning how supplements perhaps, and I don't know what those are, yeah, but. Well, it's what's really interesting because I've had a few other guests. I had Amber O'Hearn, who's a Canadian lady who's been using a very strict carnivore diet, which is similar to what I eat for more than a decade uh, as she was low carb keto for 10 years prior to that to keep her uh, chronic chronic type 2 bipolar disorder into full remission without any medication at all and she is one of a large number of people that is um, experiencing these kind of uh, epiphanous like results having experienced this firsthand like witnessing the wonderful mental health benefits and what I have achieved uh, in all facets of my life over the last three and a half years 
are really astounding physically, mentally, spiritually, psychologically, you know, whatever you want to call it. And there, there seems to be a lot of merit in uh, and a lot of uh, links between the introduction of seed oils or vegetable oils in the early 1900s in the Western world and the impact that that's having on uh, on our gut microbiome and the like glyphosate usage and a number of other things that are more than likely taking us away from that homeostatic place that we were and had been for millions of years. So I find it so interesting. And if there's a way to get people in a place that they can be anywhere like me, you know, I still have down days, but they're few and far between. I tell you what, and I bounce back real quick. You know, yeah. if you could get more people to be like that, you know, the world would be a better place. And effectively, Chris Palmer is saying that you can improve 66% of the global mental health crisis with diet. Isn't that just the most wonderful, powerful thing ever? Yes, it is. And we need people who are out on the frontier saying that. And that's partly what you're doing today in speaking out and pointing to that there is possibility and for how this might apply to public speaking anxiety, I'm sure, uh, has to do with um, the body having its own patterns that need that need something that's going to calm them down other than uh, propanol, whatever the medicines, the beta blockers that they use. So, and then in my, my deeper work with people overcoming anxiety around the roots, though, there's the whole seven secrets that I talk about in my book, which starts with stillness, with silence. And that is, um, so different than most people, you know, most speaking training programs is that you start with stillness. <laughs> and that's often incomprehensible for people that they go to learn how to overcome their fear of speaking. And we start with learning how to calm the body, calm the mind. You know, that's it. There's so much more to do, of course, but that's the foundation. The next, the next uh, piece of the work that I do with people is, I mean, I don't train them uh, relaxation techniques. I have, they get to choose whatever works for them. Nature, whether it's exercise, whether it's supplements, <laughs> whether it's meditation, whether it's an app on the phone, but they do need to be in training, you might say, be in training so that their body can go quickly, quickly from ah to ah. <laughs> I used one of those yesterday. I'm trying to leave the country and in Australia at the moment we have, it's, it's basically illegal to leave the country for some reason, uh, trying to stop COVID. And uh, so I've, I've been applying for a, an exemption permit and it's been rejected twice. And my departure date is encroaching <laughs> closer and closer. And, uh, and I flew into a rage at my, at my laptop, just at the sheer insanity of what's going on. I'm trying to get to Germany to attend the Frankfurt International Book Fair to, to promote my book, which is my business, you know. And they are taking that away from me. And I, and I started, this is me being fully transparent here. I started trying to find the person, his name was Matty. That's all, I didn't have any other information. I started trying to Boolean search this guy to see if I could find him, to see whether I could contact him and get his phone number and talk some sense into the guy and maybe even threaten him at one point. But, um, and then I just was like, Hang on a second. How irrational is this behavior? <laughs> I was like, just calm down. And I just went still. And then, hey, presto. I was like, you know what? Maddie's just doing the best he can with the tools he's got available. I resubmitted another application. Um, I'll find out in another couple of days where that's been approved and I'll, uh, I'll let you know. What are your thoughts yes. on that? Yeah, I think that you just demonstrated, Levin, you just demonstrated to people the what's possible to be in high state of emotional dysregulation, you might call it, and to be able to self-regulate by 
Uh, well, you used, I would say you used two things. One, you, you know where that calm place is inside of you. And from there, you're able to change the frame and to rethink and perceive in a way that's more positive, more accepting, and a more trusting. Because if in the end you don't get to go, there are going to be other opportunities and maybe it's not the best. So it's like acceptance of life as it comes at you and uh, finding a way to adjust. This, uh, that's a great observation, by the way, and thanks for being so generous. <laughs> it, uh, I found that I've become way more open-minded the more I sort of progress through this self-actualization journey that I'm on. Mm -hmm. And there was a guest that I had that I talk about from time to time, uh, Captain Charlie Plum. Have you ever heard that name before, Doreen? No, but it's a great name. <laughs> great name, right. Captain Charlie Plum was actually one of the guys in the U.S. Navy that founded the Top Gun School that the movies have been made since then. And he was a Navy pilot and flying like the top of the range fighter jets back in the Vietnam conflict. And on his last mission before being redeployed to his newly married wife, he was shot down over Hanoi. And he was held prisoner in the Hanoi Hilton for six years. Four mm. and a half of those years, he was held in a uh, eight foot by eight foot room in the dark. And they were essentially starved to the point of, you know, barely being kept alive. And it was only through unpolished rice and some gruel that they were, they were able to be sustained. But when they, when they were released and all were redeployed home, I'll ask you this question. You can have a shot in the dark. So of all the Vietnam veterans that returned back to America, 33% suffered from chronic PTSD. There are thereabouts. Have a guess at what percentage of the, I think it was like 700 POWs that returned, what percentage of those suffered PTSD? I don't know. It just seems like that PTSD means that you do suffer. 4%. Uh-huh. 4%. And the 4% were made up of pilots and soldiers that had been captured in the weeks and the months before the war ended. And uh -huh. so they hadn't had any time to acclimatize to the environment. And, and uh -huh. what, what Captain Plum talks about is when they were in there, they all decided that they were going to, their pledge was that they were going to come out of prison in better shape than when they went in mentally. And so they, they deployed all of their military hierarchical stuff so they you know they they had orders and they did this they developed these sophisticated communication skills because they were forbidden from speaking for for the majority of the time in incarceration and the, all of them that have come out have gone on to be leaders of industry presidential can like john mccain was in that same platoon that was you know the former vice president and it's the most extraordinary approach to adversity because no matter what I've gone through, I don't know that it'll ever be worse than six years of being held captive in a foreign country. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. Well, that reminds me of uh, Victor Frankl. Have you heard his story? Man's Search for Meaning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For he our audience, in... what is it? Uh, well, Victor Frankl was a psychologist and he was in uh, the camps the, during the Holocaust. And he, um, out of that, he came up with what writing about meaning and that uh, life and its circumstances does not determine w w the quality of your life I mean just like the war camp it's uh, the prisoner of war being he was a prisoner of war too so it's the same kind of thing of what inside of us <laughs> what's inside of us is what's possible and uh, we have to for those of us, for those who are listening and for all the people who are suffering, for all the people who are experiencing, let's just go back to public speaking anxiety, there is so much more that's possible within you and let's help you get there so that you have more of your life with fulfillment and your contribution and your voice out into the world. But Doreen, 
How do we find you? You sound like an amazing human being. Where can we connect? <laughs> Are you going to get on a plane soon? I hope. <laughs> Let's get you to California, San Francisco <laughs> Bay Area. Let's see. I think I we haven't really gone into it. Maybe another time are my seven secrets. And you can get me at, I think, just download, because I started to talk about it. The first one is stillness. The second one is presence. And they're all about learning how to use mindfulness skills to be able to speak, to find your voice and be able to speak without fear. And so if you do Doreen, D-O-R-E-E-N, Doreen, seven, number seven steps during seven steps.com. And I think if people want to email me and say, Hey, it's Doreen at essential speaking.com Doreen at essential speaking.com. And again, it's the essence of who you are. And that's why I call it essential speaking. Well, I think there will be an opportunity to have you on again in the future, Doreen, and we can explore this in more detail if you like. I really want people to uh, to take courageous action and seek out Doreen. If this message is resonating with you, she has a an untold amount of knowledge to share and impart on to people, and you have an obligation to learn how to communicate effectively, to get that 10 out of 10 message that's in your head and to communicate that into someone else's head at a, at a 10 out of 10, because if it's a four out of 10, they will receive it as a four out of 10 and it will lose the meaning that you intend it to have. And that's why hooking up with Doreen is so important. Doreen, do you have any concluding thoughts for our audience today? Well, yes. Uh, John Cabot Zinn talks about uh, wherever you go, there you are. Isn't that pretty much say it all? Is <laughs> what are you taking with you? Is who you are wherever you go, whatever conversation, whatever is asked of you, whatever meeting you happen to be in, whatever whoever you get married to. <laughs> Uh, whatever the situation is, you're going to show up. You, that's what life asks you to show up. So why not do what you just said, Laban, is to have the courage to fulfill your purpose and find your voice so that you can speak without fear anytime, anywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Doreen Downing. <laughs>